Hi, this is Mac of MaxList. Find Your Dream Job is presented by MaxList, an online community where you can find free resources for your job search, plus online courses and books that help you advance your career. My latest book is called Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. It's a reference guide for your career that covers all aspects of the job search, including expert advice in every chapter. You can get the first chapter for free by visiting maxlist.org slash anywhere. This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm Mac Pritchard, your host and publisher of MaxList. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Lila O'Hara and Jessica Black from the MaxList team. This week, we're talking about how to read between the lines of a job posting. Many job seekers treat a job posting as a list of facts about the position. That's a mistake, according to Justin Ducks, our guest expert this week. He says a position description often includes subtle clues and red flags that everybody can understand. If you learn to read between the lines, you can become a more competitive candidate, and you can avoid ending up in a snake pit. Justin and I talk later in the show. Record numbers of people today work remotely from home, and these employees can live in anywhere. One U.S. governor hopes you will bring your remote job to his state, and he will give you $10,000 if you do so. Leela tells us more in a moment. We all want balance in our life. At the end of life, nobody ever wishes they'd spent more time at the office. But what does a good work-life balance look like? That's our question of the week, and it comes from listener Leonard Bryan in Westland, Oregon. Jessica shares her advice shortly. As always, let's first check in with the MaxList team, and I'm sitting around the studio table here with Jessica and Leela. And Leela, you're up first, because you, as always, have spent the last week, I know you do other things besides poking around That's the internet. That's true, yeah. yeah. There are newsletters and blog job. posts, and, <laughs> but you it's also... A good, it's a good mix. It yeah. is a good mix, yeah, 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 I get in there, yeah. But you're always also... Always looking. Always looking. So what have you uncovered this week? Yeah, this week I found a really interesting article from the theladders.com. And if you're somebody out there who's looking for a job where you can work remotely, um, get paid up to $10,000 in relocation fees, and live in a rural environment, then I think this is an opportunity you might really be interested in. Um, because this week, Vermont Governor Phil Scott signed a new law that will pay eligible remote workers up to $10,000 to move to Vermont. That's ten thousand dollars. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And if you're interested, you'll need to become a full time Vermont resident on or after January first, twenty nineteen, which is pretty soon. And you'll also need to prove you're a full time remote worker for a company outside of the state. Um, And if you can prove those two items, then Vermont will pay for your relocation expenses by giving you up to five thousand dollars a year for two years. So they must be. just looking to to grow their their population and and is that is I mean you're I know you're going to tell us more but I am I am <laughs> yeah. right about to tell you but great. you're you're correct yeah okay, great. Jessica's jumping in you I, guessed correctly I know I just <laughs> I want to know what the catch is yeah yeah, well, yeah there is a catch a okay bit. let's hear the catch yeah so Vermont is hoping to use this program to boost their economy and grow their population because a lot of their population is aging out of the workforce and oh, they only have yeah 625 residents statewide. Um, which means that they have a very small tax base and a very high demand for young workers, particularly. That's 625,000, not 625 residents. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> a little bit of a difference there, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's also not the first state to try this out, which I thought was interesting. Um, oh, yeah. There's a couple small towns in Michigan and Ohio that are also offering financial incentives for people who are willing to move um, to their states in order to address worker shortages. I like that idea. I think that's a really good way. I mean, I think there's ways to just 
boost tourism in general, but having people, um, having people move there. And now that we do have so much of a, um, a remote worker sort of boom, or it's, you know, it's easy Mm -hmm. to work remotely that you don't have to necessarily have an office or have a, 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 an in-person work environment there. So, yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, times have changed a lot. Um, so I thought that that was really worth noting too. And if you're a job seeker who's interested in working remotely, I also found this website called, um, we work remotely.com, which is like a huge, they claim they're the largest online community of remote workers. And, um, just from glancing through there, they had a lot of programming, marketing, design, and copywriting jobs for people who don't want to be tied down to a particular location. Or if you just don't want to commute to work, you want to save money that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot of great options out there for people looking for remote work. Or if you're just looking for work in those industries, it might Mm -hmm. be a good place to look. Yeah, it could be a great next opportunity for you. And yeah, one reason I found this article so interesting is because um, we kind of have the opposite problem here in Portland, yeah. like in terms of people moving here, because with Vermont, there might not be a ton of people moving there, but Portland is growing super fast and super rapidly. We have a huge influx of young millennial workers moving in. Mm-hmm. Um, so the housing market is booming and more taxpayers are arriving. And um, you would think that the job market is like thriving and we're doing great, but for employers, I think it's still really tough. Um, Well, I think that's interesting that you brought that up because it is um, similar in that sense that there are a lot of remote workers from um, California or other states that are still having, they're still employed with their jobs wherever it is, but they are living in Portland. That's also um, true. Yeah. And not exclusively true, but I think yeah, yeah, that yeah. is, um, that's a big factor in Portland as well. And so that's really interesting. It's just really interesting. Yeah. Maybe Vermont yeah. needs to do a, um, a TV show like Vermont Landia or something like that. Maybe kind of like some, something to draw people in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not sure. That's what brought people to Portland, <laughs> but it, it was probably a factor, Jessica. I think yeah. so. Okay. Yeah, so it's just interesting because depending on where you live, there's just different, you know, problems that job seekers or employers face because there's, you know, 4% unemployment here. That just makes it really competitive out there um, for employers looking for job seekers. Definitely. And yeah, as more and more baby boomers and the older generation starts to hit retirement age, it's just interesting to think about what cities are going to do to keep up. Um, will we see more cities taking up the strategy that Vermont's using and paying younger workers to move into their state? Or will we see young workers like willing to re- relocate to the these like kind of rural environments away from the big city? Um, because states and cities need a growing population of young educated taxpayers and workers to thrive. But um, I just find it interesting and I'm fascinated to see how these rural areas keep up with the just rapid growth of cities. Yeah. I agree with you that it's really fascinating. I'm glad that you brought this up. Yeah. Uh, I, I think you both know I grew up in Iowa and the it's very common for people after college, uh, many of them to, to leave the state. There was a governor um, yeah, in the early 2000s who launched a campaign to encourage former Iowa residents to return. And he, his administration, I think three or four times a year, would send newsletters to former residents. And I got on the list because I'm a University of Iowa graduate. It didn't really work, and uh, but it was there was no cash incentive. Mm. But there was a, an, a, a strategic effort to try to get persuade people to return. Um, coincidentally, I went back for my Harvard Kennedy School reunion, and uh, he was at a reception, and I went up and chatted him, and I said, hey, I'm a former Iowa resident. He said, why didn't you come back? <laughs> <laughs> and I, for, for me, personally, the answer was quality of life. It was, it's just better here in the Pacific Northwest. I don't know. It'll be cur- interesting to see if money is uh, enough of a motivator to persuade people to, to go to Vermont, which is a lovely state, but it's— I think that's an interesting yeah. point, yeah. Mac, because I do think that there um, that money is a, a good motivator, but yeah. there has to be there has to be a, a full onslaught of of factors that that contribute to that. And um, there are some people who really like rural, rural living sure. um, and really are pursuing that and and trying to get out of the larger cities and move to quieter spaces that they can have that type of life. But um, I think. There also needs to be an effort. I mean, it all goes back to 
marketing drives everything, right? Is that you have to um, you have to reach the right people that right. are going to be the the folks who are going to quote unquote fit in in that environment and that are going to thrive in that environment. Because if you're if you're talking to urbanites. Um, about come to the country and live in the country and we'll give you $5,000 a year, that's not really going to um, have any kind of return on investment. But um, but if you're reaching the right people who are really craving that quiet life, then I think that that would be a good a good motivator. Good point. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you both. And thank you, Leela, for bringing those resources to our attention. If you've got an idea for Leela, please write her. We'd love to share your suggestion on the show. Her address is leela at maxlist.org. Now let's turn to you, our listeners. And Jessica Black has been adding to the MaxList mailbag all week long. I know the emails just keep pouring in. They do, which is great. They I, do. I love to hear them yeah. and I love to to get them. And I got a I got a note from someone on LinkedIn the other day. So okay, good. Um, however you want to send me your question, just go ahead. All right, terrific. Well, what's in the mailbag this week? What What question did you pull out? We have a question this week from Leonard Bryan, who is from West Lynn, Oregon, um, one of the suburbs of Portland. And he asks, a lot of people talk about finding an employer that offers a good work-life balance. How do you all, the Find Your Dream Job team, define work-life balance? And what is your advice for finding employers who match your definition? So I think this is a great question because I think that um, work-life balance is sort of on the minds of a lot of people right now as we're shifting gears from just uh, finding employers that are going to, you know, pay you and, and have a place to go every, every day and every week. Um, People are also looking for other ways that they can find meaning from their jobs. And, um, and sometimes that comes in to play with the work-life balance and talking about remote remote work having an increase, um, there are a lot more opportunities for people to want to work um, remotely or have flexible jobs um, as parents or however that looks for them. And so I think it's uh, it's a really good question. And I I think what makes a quote unquote good work-life balance is going to depend on who you are as a person. It's going to differ for each person. But I do um, want to share a bit about the MaxList team um, and our what we do for work life balance. And this is these are just a couple of the things that we do. But um, we offer uh, we have a flexible work schedule in that um, we work from home on Friday. So we have the typical Monday through Friday, nine to five or eight to four, however that looks. But, um, but we do work from home on Fridays. And I think that provides a good, um, good opportunity for people to have some, a respite from meetings sometimes, or you can work from your pajama in your pajamas or work from a coffee shop or just have your, have a space that you can feel, um, feel like you can be out of the office, but still doing work and, and be trusted to get that all done. So I think that's really important. Um, and along those same lines, we have a flexible and trusting team that accommodates time off needs, um, good sick leave policy and PTO policy. That is, is sort of a, you know, if, if you need to take time off, then we will um, just let us let us know, kind of a thing. Um, so there's, it's not super strict, and I think that trusting the team to get things done and that everybody's in it together will cover each other um, to keep things going well. I think that's really important, and um, we also one of the important things that I feel is important is um, that we encourage a full disconnect when people are on vacation, and so. Um, and managers who lead by example on this, for example, Mac takes a vacation um, a couple of times a year, a year, but at least once a year, a long, long-term three or four week vacation um, and disconnects completely is not available for work email. You know, you don't check your work email while you're out and, and, um, and that sort of thing. And I think that that is a really good model for, um, for others of us in the office to, 
to take the hint on of, um, you know, when you're on vacation, you're, you should be away so that you can fully recharge. And I think that's really important. Um, and you know, these are just a couple of things that I wanted to point out with there's, there's definitely other things that go into this and go into work-life balance, but, um, but this is something that's really important to me as well. And this is, um, these are the questions that I asked during my interview process with MaxList, um, just to make sure that there are, um, just to be able to understand what that looks like and because it does differ for every person. And, um, you know, I asked questions like, do people eat lunch at their desks? Is that expected of, of people do, you know, and that goes to the larger model of, is this a place that you work all the way through lunch and you're expected to just be tied to your desk all the time? And that's, the answer was no. <laughs> and which is wonderful because that's really important to me that there are times that you, you do get to disconnect and you do get to walk away from your job and you're, you're not having to answer emails at 7 PM and you're discouraged from that and those types of things. So, um, long story short, I, um, I would say depending on your own needs. So number one, um, Leonard, I would, I would say check in with what's important to you. Um, you know, write down the things that are really important to you of what makes a good work-life balance for you. Um, and start doing some research online. So for example, I think, um, a while ago, Ben shared a resource, uh, about parents finding employers who offer flexible work schedules for, um, for being able to match their, their children's school schedules, things like that. Um, and so, uh, and another, another way to do this is I, for example, I entered, um, how to find employers with work-life balance into Google. And there were several lists of companies reputed to have excellent work-life balance. So that's a really good place to start. And then you can sort of comb through, um, and see what comes up for you from that. And, um, Again, the main way I'd, I would suggest doing this is to just talk to people, have some informational interviews with um, with people that you um, have in your network already that are um, working in companies that you would like to work for or that you're curious about. Um, reach out and just have those types of questions. And, um, and I would just, again, encourage, know what that looks like for you so that you you know what your goals are um, so that because one company can have a quote unquote great work life balance, but that doesn't match with what your work life balance is. And so that's not going to help you at all if it doesn't match your needs and your desires. So what else do you guys, would you guys add? Yeah, I think that um, for Leonard to really thrive and figure out what his ideal work life balance is, Um, I think one thing he has to do is just kind of look at, you know, what are his needs and his kind of like personal um, priorities. Um, If he's the type of person that needs to take a walk at lunch every day to kind of clear his head and refresh, or if he needs a place where he can like work remotely or have like a solid baseline of pay time off. um, Those are all things he kind of needs to identify and then find an employer who can like give him that level of work-life balance. So I think you made a great point with that, Jessica. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I, I would only add that when you're considering employers, ask to look at uh, the employee handbook. Uh, do mm-hmm. they provide parental leave? Mm-hmm. Uh, um, what are the, how many holidays? What, what are the vacation policies? Uh, and, you know, here at, at MaxList, we close between Christmas and New Year's oh, yeah. with pay. That's one of my favorite benefits. So yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I came, it, took us a number of years to adopt that policy. I, but as an employer, I learned that most people uh, would take that time off. Some wouldn't. They'd come in. I'd tell everyone to go home early. Mm-hmm. So why not just tell, tell them to go home? <laughs> right. <laughs> and and you have much more productive in the end. I was going to say, you have mentioned that, um, you know, everybody comes back much more refreshed because spending time with families and right. just having that time off is really important. And, and, you know, that time of year is very, most people are not working that time of year anyway. And so it's, it's better to just close it down. Yeah. So it's a great question, Leonard, and I appreciate you asking it. And thanks for the, the good advice, Jessica. If you've got a question for Jessica, uh, please send her an email. That address is jessica at maxlist.org. 
You can also call that listener line. We'd love to get a recording from you, area code 716 Job Talk, or post your question on the MaxList Facebook group. If we use your question on the show, like Leonard, you'll get a copy of Land Your Dream Job Anywhere. We'll be back in just a moment, and when we return, I'll talk with this week's guest expert, Justin Ducks, about how to read between the lines of a job posting. If you're listening to this show, there are two things I know about you. First, you're a fan of podcasts. Second, you're looking for tools and tips that can help you get a great job and move ahead in your career. That's why I'm excited to announce MaxList's newest resource, and it's designed for podcast listeners like you. We just published the 2018 edition of the Top Career Podcast Guide. It's a directory of this year's best podcasts, for finding a job that matters and building the career you want. This is our most complete podcast guide ever. You'll discover 78 great shows from around the world. From resume writing advice to salary negotiation tips, you'll find great shows to help you tackle any job search challenge. Get your free copy of Top Career Podcast Guide today. Go to topcareerpodcasts.com. Again, that's topcareerpodcasts.com. Com. Now, let's get back to this podcast. Now, let's turn to this week's guest expert, Justin Ducks. Justin Ducks hosts Career Cloud Radio. It's a podcast for job seekers that began in 2007. He regularly interviews job hunting experts who offer useful and actionable tips. And he is a proud graduate of the Twin Cities campus of the University of Minnesota. Justin joins us today from St. Paul, Minnesota. Justin, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited about this conversation because, uh, you know, you're a fellow podcaster, and, and I, I'm impressed that your show has been on for more than a decade. That's that's quite an accomplishment for for you and your predecessors. Well, thank you. Uh, Chris Russell founded the show, and it changed ownership uh, last year. So we just passed our one year, or I just passed my one year mark of being a host. So. Well, that's terrific. Uh, today we're talking about job postings, and uh, th- there's an art to reading these postings, you say, and, and you find, however, that most job seekers just scan a posting quickly before they prepare an application. Justin, why is that a problem? I'm, I'm hearing from guests and others that um, culturally we're changing how we consume information. And, you know, it starts with skimming, but it actually, the end result is you stop looking entirely. So you might read a posting and never click into it, uh, read a title that would be a job title and never click into it. And so a lot of people will complain that I'm not seeing any opportunities that match my skill set, but they've ruled out hundreds of opportunities that never came across their face or their computer screen in this example. Well, how should our listeners read a job posting? What 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 do you recommend and what should they look for? I recommend that they take a step backwards from the end goal, which is I want to find a job to apply to tonight. And if you work backwards and say, I need to find out what the market is looking for, and I need to understand the patterns that are appearing in these job postings, you actually have to consume or read ton more job postings than you think necessary because those patterns don't start developing or understandings as what they become uh, for maybe a couple months. Um, So what that looks like for somebody is they're um, monitoring job boards even while they have a career they're happy with and uh, getting alerts from job boards uh, even when they think they're not looking, maybe like a passive job seeker at that stage. Um, For those of you that are more urgent, obviously, you got to put this on steroids and do all of this kind of research every day, but it's much more manageable if you kind of take a longer view on it and say, I'm going to keep my finger on this pulse so that I always have that information ready when it's time to apply. What patterns do you recommend that people look for when they study job posts? What what should jump out at at the job seeker and, and what can they learn from that? So it kind of breaks into about three different areas for me. The obvious, the one that'll seem kind of obvious, but I want to try to dig deeper on is recognizing things to avoid. 
Um, so f- there's two areas there, avoiding things with the, the responsibilities of the job and avoiding red flags with the employer and what might be happening in that company. So I would describe that as like avoid the sinking ship. Uh, if, if you're not happy with the headlines in Uber or another company that's hit, hitting headlines right now or a mining company or something, then maybe you do want to stay away from that if they are looking for a new head of privacy or a new head of uh, HR or something like that. Now, if you're the type of person who likes to rescue a sinking ship, then maybe you run towards that burning fire, but you never want to be in a company that's revenues about to go down or going down for reasons that are completely out of your control. Because when you're developing a career, you obviously want to step into a situation that you can succeed in. And is that information you get from a job posting, Justin? Or if you find a position, say an opportunity at Uber, you, you, then you do the research and you find out more about the company through other sources? Great point. You would bring in uh, informational interviews uh, with uh, people that work there already if you add that company to your short list. And so if, you, if you're doing this over the course of a year or two, um, let's say, kind of, like I said, you're starting at a time where you're probably happy in your career, um, you have more time to set up those informational interviews. But more importantly, you have more time to develop a short list. Uh, so here in the Twin Cities, my list is only about 15 companies right now that I would now say are on my short list. And for a lot of people that um, I talk to, that, that short list might even be, be less, you know, f- a few companies. But what you do is you start to research that company more heavily. Now you're reading articles about the company, maybe dive, diving into their shareholders' notes. There's a lot, a wealth of information in shareholder meeting minutes if the company is public. Okay. Um, because I- it talks about the goals they're working on. And anytime they make word it as a goal, you can also translate that into the problem they're probably trying to solve because most companies don't dump millions of dollars in investment unless they also see that as a problem. Okay. So we talked about red flags and how research can help you identify those and, and goals and how they can help you understand the employer's needs and challenges. What are some other clues that people should look for, Justin, as they review job postings and, and, and try to find those patterns? The one that I find fascinating is what I would call unusual search terms or unusual keywords. And uh, th- this information I learned from uh, Textio, uh, T-E-X-T-I-O, but they, they really inspired me to change how I was searching and, and other people. Because I, I don't think a lot of people sit down and think to put into a search engine uh, like Indeed or, or ZipRecruiter, name your favorite right there. But um, a term like dream, quote unquote, uh, people wouldn't think to search for that. But Textio's research determined that teachers will find those jobs and apply to those jobs 21 days faster than a, a school that's not using that word inside their job posting somewhere. And so, you know, that's looking at it from the hiring perspective, but I'm coming at it from the candidate perspective and saying, why don't we search for those things that are that important to us that we would apply sooner or those positions would fill faster? If it's important to you, you should be searching for it. Um, might be a little limiting to use like vacation time, but I will say unlimited vacation time as your keyword might be something worth looking up, if it, if, especially if you're trying to deal with two kids or a family or something like that. Some other creative examples might be lasting relationships. If you're dealing with like a sales career or something like that, that would be huge because that shows the employers culturally aware that we're not trying to make transactions here. We're not trying to bring in revenue. We're actually trying to form lasting relationships with our customers. And they put that wording right into the job posting. Um, something like hungry for is, uh, is usually, it's like a verb. It, verbs work better for this technique, by the way. Um, hungry for and then fill in the blank but you're finding these these unusual terms and then using them repeatedly so when i say finding that means we were doing that we talked about a moment ago you're consuming postings that you never intended to apply to and that's part of the gate you have to get past mentally is that yeah you are clicking into postings that are just intriguing or a little less than intriguing 
to try to pick up these clues that might be in the form of these unusual keywords and then stop reading after you find one and say, what if I were to put this in as a term and, and see what that comes up with? So I just, uh, I did a test on that last night and I found an interesting phrase that I wasn't using before, uh, design, build, create, like a posting I had found that I had no intention of applying to had used those three words right next to each other, design, build, and create. And they were referring to some sort of process in a, in a skill set that I work in. And I went and I punched that in. In about five minutes of clicking on a couple different job titles, different postings, I found some really interesting stuff that was not on my radar at all because of my usual ter- terms. Did that make sense? It does. And what you're describing, uh, as I listen to you, Justin, is really a search engine marketing approach to identifying both companies and and positions that might not normally appear on someone's radar because I think most job seekers, don't you agree, Justin? They they think, well, I want to work at this company or I want to find a position with this job title. And what I'm hearing you say is you can do that, but you won't see opportunities that might be even more interesting. Even more interesting and even more of a match to your skills. So um, for the last year and a half, um, I've been developing skills in Salesforce. And I, so I think that that's going to show up in the job title itself. It's just natural to make that assumption. And the, the techniques I'm describing here are meant to break those habits. So, you know, the end result was last night, I find a position that's titled technology enablement specialist, which I would never have searched for. But I found what, what I would describe as a perfect match for my background because it describes supporting sales reps because I did 10 years of sales and working with their Salesforce uh, processes that enable those, their sales team. And um, the, the last thing that made me really intrigued about this one is a point that I really want to make for, for your listeners. And that is to the more you do this type of reading, this kind of deep reading, and to, to use your term, search engine marketing, kind of reverse engineering of job postings, the more you develop that as a skill, you'll start to be able to sense an opportunity that's bigger than described on the page. And so, you know, technology enablement specialist, you know, you share it with, I shared it with some, some people that are close to me and they're like, well, it seems kind of low level to you, doesn't it? I was like, not really. I'm just starting my career. It's not, it's not as a, advanced. It's not like I've been at this 10 years or something like that. I've got, I've got a foundation to build just like anyone else. And I think that's the key is like all the clues accumulate to mean something more. And it's an intuition that's really hard to describe. I'm realizing, but it, you won't know it unless you've consumed hundreds, if not uh, you know, close to a thousand job postings in your industry to be able to recognize those patterns. What are your best tips, Justin, about identifying those keywords that you should search for? How do you, how can listeners build a list like that? What do you recommend? It's really comes down to consuming them, but um, it's about as you read, how does it make you feel? So uh, take, for example, we were talking earlier about uh, things to avoid. If you read the word strict, in a job posting and, and your senses kind of tingle, like you kind of get a little goosebumps or you even see the, the you're reading, but your mouth starts to cringe or that kind of thing. That's a sign. You should probably pick that up as a clue and even write down that word as I'm not probably working well in a culture that's describing a strict work culture. Um, another thing that comes to mind is there's some marketers that are like more on the creative side. So if they're seeing words in a job posting and say detail oriented, and that makes them kind of panic a little bit, that's another clue. You might not want to uh, prioritize this job as high as another one you might have found that that week. Now, keep in mind, sometimes you only find one opportunity a week and you probably should still apply to the, some of these. But I'm trying to work in, a, in an area of abundance where there's more opportunities than people realize and you kind of have to pick the first three you want to apply to when you have a limited amount of time this weekend. 
So, so that's on the avoid side. On the, on the more positive side, you want to be able to recognize a culture that you'll love. And these are going to be harder because they, they stand out in different ways. So um, kind of going back to that research from Textio, you know, they've you know, used algorithms to search across millions of job postings and, and then com- correlate that with data about how fast the positions were taken down or filled. And to their surprise, they learned that some things are popular in one city that are completely hated in another city. So I think the, the example they used was intense. Uh, it's the word found in the, the um, posting somewhere is, you know, this intense culture or this intense sales environment or you know, high pressure environment. And, and the word intense was received really well in San Francisco and that attracted candidates to apply to it. And those are opportunities that some, you and I might be missing out on because they've already filled them. But you go over to Philadelphia and a position that's mentioning the word intense is lagging out there and staying unfilled, which is because most people in Philadelphia don't want to work in an intense environment or there's other stigmas around it. And so you want to recognize what those are for you. You know, if you know a culture that you thrive in, start figuring out the, the language you would use to describe that and search for it. Okay. And pay attention to your intuitive reactions, both positive and negative and record those words and, and then make them part of your search strategy. Right. And I think one of my guests said this best when there's like people, or a lot of young people, especially kind of have developed this idea that finding a job and searching for one online is a science in that it's a, um, like a machine. I'm not quoting them very well, but you get the point. And it's, I'm trying to bring that art side back into it, which means you do have to kind of allow yourself to feel about these positions, but be objective while you're doing it and say, well, yeah, it says detail oriented and that makes me cringe, but it doesn't change the fact that I really love accuracy. Well, you might actually still have the, the attribute of detail oriented because you hate inaccuracy. Does that make sense? It does. Well, I, these are terrific tips, Justin, I, and I've enjoyed the conversation. Tell us what's next for you. Um, I'm continuing to work on Career Cloud Radio. It's the uh, podcast that uh, I took over as host for last May. Uh, we've got 10 episodes already recorded that I'm furiously working on editing and getting out there. And it's, uh, it's my hope that you know, listeners find some more insights from those. And I know you have a, a deep archive of episodes that stretch back to 2007. So there's a lot of good content there. And people I know good. can find it at careercloud.com. Justin, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me. Take care. We're back in the studio with Layla and Jessica. And what are your thoughts about my conversation with Justin? Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting conversation, Mac. Um, one thing that I hadn't really considered um, before this conversation was um, just reading the job listing really carefully and um, looking for clues, whether it's clues about the company culture or clues about what they're looking for. Um, and a candidate, those are all things that can either tell you like, this is the right fit for me. Like this is really where I want to apply, or maybe this isn't the right job, um, mm-hmm. for you. Cause I think, um, a lot of candidates, myself included, will just apply to a bunch of job listings that like, cause that, you know, if I was looking for a marketing coordinator position, I would just apply to a bunch of jobs with that job title. Um, but if you take a lot closer look at the description, then you might see that, you know, this is a marketing coordinator position, but maybe they're doing sales or maybe there's other stuff included within that job yeah. that, you know, that that's kind of thrown in there as a little tiny bullet or an asterisk in the uh, description. But if you read it really closely, you can figure out like, oh, this isn't for me. Like I, I do, shouldn't be applying here. I agree with you. I really do think that you can, you can learn a lot about the way 
that the organization talks about what they do or the language that they use kind of, um, I liked that Justin mentioned that of like, if they use a word like strict or, Mm -hmm. um, whatever that is, I liked how you can discern some things, um, from that kind of language that they use. Um, but also taking a look at their websites and, um, doing some, some research about the organization, um, in addition to just reading the the job description because um, you can also learn some things and find some some um, either positive things or red flags um, by just looking at the website or looking at um, news articles or or things like that that um, you can just as you learn more about the organization you'll either learn if it's a good fit or maybe it's not the right fit um, but what I really loved about that conversation was his um, his suggestion about doing the reverse search um, of entering verbs or phrases or um, or whatever that is uh, into into a search field, um, and we've talked about Textio before. We we've used that as a resource before, so I liked that he brought that back up. But um, but using that to be able to help you uh, expand upon the job postings that you're receive or that you're finding that you're coming across rather than just, um, the, the job title, because sometimes organizations do have creative job titles or, um, or you don't always know, like for, for me, uh, Leela, you were searching for marketing coordinator positions, but for me, I did a lot of that, um, just like pouring through postings mm-hmm. just to see reading job descriptions, just to get a better understanding of what that job looked like related to the title. Um, because I was still trying to figure out what that, what that looked like. And I knew types, the types of work that I wanted to do, but I didn't know the title name. Right. So being able to, um, but you don't always have time to pour through thousands of job no. postings just to, um, just to like, it's so much, um, content and so much out there. But if you have that opportunity, please do so. Otherwise, if you have the ability to, to enter those search terms into something and do, um, I liked, I just liked that he provided that as a resource for, um, finding other, other postings that you may not find through other searches that you might do. Yeah. I, I liked his advice a lot because, I think there are two challenges here. One is, and you touched on this, Jessica, there's an abundance of choices. There it's are. never been easier to find uh, job postings in, in whatever your occupation. So how do you sort through all this information? How do you sift this data? And that uh, Justin is offering a strategy, which is, okay, think about uh, the, the keywords that either you have a positive reaction to or a negative. And it is Mm -hmm. search engine marketing or S101 applied to the job search. And I think that helps a lot. And and I think the second challenge people have is not only tossing through, getting the the number of postings down to a manageable figure that you can apply to, but it's also being... um, uh, being able to read those the subtleties of those postings to figure out which ones might be most appealing and which ones, as he called it, might have some red flags. Yeah. And that will further help you reduce the number of applications that you might send out, which is important because our time is our most valuable asset. And if there are, as you say, uh, Leela, lots and lots of marketing coordinator jobs you can apply to, you can't apply to them all. No. So. Uh, and they're not all, all going to be the right fit, even if it's mm-hmm. the right title for you. You, yeah. have, you still have to find the right organizational fit at the same time. So Definitely. How do, how do you make the smartest, most strategic, strategic choices? And then, then, of course, job postings matter. Uh, right. We got a job board at Maxless. We're very proud of it. But Absolutely. we've talked a lot about how you need to free up your time. You can't spend all your time applying for online jobs. Absolutely. So you got to make wise choices. And I think Justin's offered a strategy for how to do that. Yeah. He I really did. liked his... Um, it was an, uh, a good way to disseminate some of some of that of just, like you said, Mac, the abundance of what's out there to be able to sift through it. So it was really interesting. Good. Well, thank you both for those comments. And thank you, Justin, for joining us this week. And thank you, our listeners, for downloading today's episode of Find Your Dream Job. 
If you're looking for more great career-focused shows like ours, make sure you check out the 2018 edition of our Top Careers Podcast Guide. You'll discover 78 programs that can help you get hired. You can get your free copy of the Top Careers Podcast today. Just go to topcareerpodcast.com. And join us next Wednesday. Our special guest will be Taranam Khan. She'll explain how to make your resume attractive to recruiters. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.